Hello everyone and welcome back to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Will Schick, Director of Product Development for Atomic Mass Games and today we're going to be painting Psylocke from the Emma Frost and Psylocke character pack that's going to be hitting store shelves here in the next few weeks. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. We've got lots to do on this fine ninja lady today. Uh, so we're just going to be going for a pretty traditional and classic comic book look. So I'm going to start off with um, doing the nah, change of mind. I'm going to start off by basing out the skin. And the reason I'm going to do that is because um, most of the flesh tones are beneath the cloth itself. So by doing, oh, I got such a bubble. Um, so by doing the skin first, we know that the blue will cover it because blue is a really strong color. It's a bully. And this will just make clean up and everything else super easy as well. So you know, start knocking in things. I'm going to start with Resurrection Flesh because it was the first flesh tone that I found. And it's a fairly okay base. Just to get things started. And we'll knock this out and move along as quickly as we can here. And I will make sure and do my best to, at some point, if Summer gives me that 15 minute warning, we'll move on and we'll do some energy effects on her telekinetic blade over there. Kind of see how we can approach it with the colors we have at hand. So, this is one of those minis where it probably would behoove you to leave at least this piece off because it does kind of get in the way. And honestly, when it comes to like the ribbon and painting the ribbon separately it's really easy to be able to tell like where your highlights and your shadows should be on it so i think it's one of those parts where you're going to actually save yourself some time as opposed to spending more time trying to like get everything right and that can happen um, and then obviously you're able to see a lot of the detail underneath the ribbon so if the part covers stuff up but you can't see what's beneath it I always say just put it on there and don't paint the thing you'll never see. But in some instances, um, you will see beneath the part, and so it can be a lot quicker and easier to maybe leave that part off. So it'll go. And the ribbon's also not going to cause a ton of shadow, so like a big, a big cape or a cloak I would put on anyway because... All of the colors under there are going to be really dark anyway because it's going to be all in shadow. But this ribbon, well, sizable and swoopy. It's not heavy enough that it's going to really shadow everything beneath it. So, Doo -doo -doo. Do one more pass on the skin tone, just to kind of like bulk it out really nice. So we get a nice, smooth, even coat as much as possible. You do want to watch those flesh tone colors. Usually they're lighter pigments, so it'll take a couple extra coats. And if you try to slap them on, like I'm doing here, a little bit on that thigh, you might wind up with some very serious brush strokes showing, and we don't want that. So. A little bit more moisture, a little bit more water. Make sure they're nice and flowing smooth and thin, and that'll avoid that kind of chunky grossness that you can get on lighter, weaker pigments like yellows are really notorious for it. Oranges can be really troublesome. Reds can also have this effect as well. Um, so just take your time. 
We only get an hour together on this little transmission, but obviously when it comes to your own hobby time and your own miniatures, hopefully you have a bit more than an hour. At least in total. Maybe your hobby session is only an hour. Usually what mine wind up being. I squeeze in an hour here, an hour there. I don't usually get too much more than that. But that's why we just kind of work to a point, leave it, and come back later. Okay, so we got our basic flesh toned down. Yeah, the overall the sculpting team really came to came through on Psylocke here with all of the effects and the posing and everything. That was, um, you know, we talk a lot about finding the right pose and then relaying that properly in a miniature. This is one of those ones where she started off a lot more crouchy and uh, lower to the ground, kind of in a more like loaded spring pose. But the problem with that is miniatures are already small. We mostly see them from the top down. So when you start to really compress the chest and the body, you see very little of the character and that's always a problem because we want to be able to see our cool characters and see the detail and make sure that everything we're painting is coming through properly. And so we played a lot with the Psylocke pose as we went through sculpting and cam and stuff to make sure that we found that right middle ground between having her feel very loaded and action oriented like she's just cut through a bunch of sentinels but also that you can see all of the great detail and the character comes through and all that good stuff. So um, the pose definitely was one of those ones that took a little bit to figure out. But we did eventually get there. I think she turned out really great. Very characterful, very fun mini to paint. Lots going on. We definitely, from the very start with the X-Men 2, you know, a lot of people are talking about the Sentinel leg and everything, but if you go back, you'll notice that quite a few of the mutant characters often incorporate Sentinels into their, into their sculpts and their miniatures, whether it's a base element or just part of the pose, like Colossus holding up the Sentinel arm. And it was one of those things where we looked for opportunities to do it and kind of showcase it. Cyclops being one of the very first of the mutant characters to be standing on something sentinel-y. Although at the time, um, his sentinel bit is certainly not quite as uh, heavily defined as some of the others that came later. Part of that really came down to the fact that as we worked on the sentinels and got those massive sculpts and characters designed. We had more assets and everything to make sure that the Sentinels all kind of tied together. So Psylocke here was worked on at a similar time as the Sentinels. So we had that foot asset to use. Colossus was another one. Kind of goes back to the discussions we have about how CP number and release windows and stuff, things are worked on in kind of big waves internally, but the way, the order in which they're worked on and where they stand and stuff doesn't necessarily always translate directly into release schedule. So there are many factors that come into like what releases when and certain things will get pushed or delayed. Some things will get moved up. So it's always kind of neat 
to see things come through that you feel like you worked on forever ago. Be brand new again. You get to re-experience all that hard work and discussions and toil that you that we all do internally to make sure that these sculpts come through and the characters come through and getting to watch the hot take reactions to the rules and stuff. That always be pretty fun. Uh, I know that Summer and the marketing team, BK, Liz, and all those folks, they're working pretty hard on the new website, and things are moving slower than anyone would like, obviously, but they're moving along, so... For those asking about like scale and uh, everything, obviously each game does have its own scale. It has its own kind of dimensionality to make things fit and look proper. So it can lead to differences in part thickness. There's also minimums that you have to be concerned with and stuff. Um, so you obviously don't want miniatures in the same game to look out of place. And that's the most important bit about scale. It's scale really is your measuring tool to make sure that, you know, your six foot tall characters all fit together and look appropriate. And you do cheat scale. And you can work around scale and stuff. It's not a hard It's not an immutable rule. In fact, if you took calipers to a lot of your kneeling characters or characters that were like crouched down and stuff, you'd actually notice that they're out of scale in terms of some of their key measurements to characters that are standing more straight up or more vertical. And that's because obviously the more compressed the body gets, the harder it is for the eye to read. So one of the ways that you can Make sure that a character still reads well, but has a more compressed pose. Or, you know, you think about Black Panther, which came out forever ago. He's actually quite large if you measured all of his like limb measurements and stuff compared to what he should be, because he's got that cool panthery crouch pose. And so, part of the way to make that look good compared to everything else in the line and let the miniature read so the character shows and everything was to increase the scale of some of his other pieces that make him up. What was any of your kit? I assume you mean like rules wise? Um, I mean, rules wise for Psylocke, she came together actually pretty easy. Um, most of it was fine-tuning and balancing her offensive and defensive capabilities and output. Um, but definitely the original kind of design space and vision of the character was pretty simple um, and straightforward to kind of know. Psychic Ninja... There's a lot of really cool storylines and everything. Um, her Crimson Dawn tactic card was a big Josh Cologne edition. He was very adamant about 
expressing that with this character and it's a big moment in her story arc and stuff so we came up with a tactic card piece there and I believe um, the other really exciting thing for us about that card the Crimson Dawn is I believe Joe Ma no War Joe Vereen that's it um, was the artist on that one so that was that was really fun and I know Josh had a lot of a lot of glee about getting to work with such an incredible comic book artist as Joe Vereen and everything else so very cool but yeah as far as like um, development and dev and design Psylocke she had her she had challenges but they were the same as most of them and I think part of that is just because you know uh, she was right next to Emma Frost and Emma Frost being a transforming character and everything that Emma Frost does <laughs> anything would feel pretty simplistic and straightforward compared to that because well, Emma Frost wasn't a huge, huge challenge. Um, you know, there's just more that goes into a character that can do the transformation mechanic and use it than a character, a non-transforming character. And honestly, raw offensive kind of powerhouses typically are pretty... low on the difficulty scale to design unless they're you know like super high threat characters like your six and seven threats then you have to start thinking about okay well how does this character compete costing as much as two characters but you know not having the board presence and kind of the innate durability and options and opportunities that a two character two separate characters would get as well So, but when you're talking like threat three, threat four, bruisers, it's pretty easy to math out what those do. And then the challenge becomes, you know, checking their efficiencies, making sure that they're able to engage, able to do cool stuff but not oppressive with what they want to do. Okay, I'm gonna do this really quick. Um, as far as the split designs on the card, that really comes down to space and rules and stuff. So, you know, if a character's transformation mechanic and the way in which they do things is um, not word intensive, you might see it on the split design. However, what we found is even on those characters in the newer format because of localization and um, needing to keep in mind the fact that different languages require different amounts of text and the spacing and everything that goes into that. Um, for the most part, I think you're gonna see that as those cards transition into that horizontal, that new horizontal format, um, most transforming characters are gonna actually wind up being two different two different cards that are side by side. Even original Transformers like the Wasp and Ant-Man and stuff because um, we have to make sure that as these cards become localized and everything moves into it that we're providing enough space for that localization text to be put in and that everything works and is comfortable and spaced properly. 
so. That's part of the reason why you see characters like Emma Frost um, on that two card design. What? Pull rank and give us a tidbit. I don't know what the tidbit is, so. Summer could try to cut my mic. She has a button. If the current discussion is about genre breaking or fourth wall breaking superheroes, My favorite one of those has always been She-Hulk number one, the original fourth wall breaker in Marvel. And number two, probably Gwenpool. But I see a lot of talk about rodents, so who knows? Okay, let's see, so that's fine. Go ahead and do some really quick highlights. Put out a whole bunch of blues just so I could see what I wanted to play with. So I don't plan on using all these colors, but sometimes it's just better instead of trying to figure it out in the bottle instead put a bunch of drops on there and then just play with it as as you go along so what I'm doing here so now I know kind of which colors I want to play with and which ones I don't We're just going to do some really kind of stylized, rough highlights here because we got lots to do, but we can still make it look pretty darn cool. So just some quick. Dirty two brush blending. <sighs> Is who going to be able to rewrite game rolls? I don't think Squirrel Girl would, if that's what we're asking. But could a Gwenpool? I guess. There's a level of um, <laughs> there's a level of insanity though, when it comes to we want to make you know cool characters that are fun and interesting, but also are balanced within a standard game environment, so. You know, it's something to keep in mind for sure. Like, yeah, you could get pretty wild and, and crazy, but uh, I don't know how many people would wanna play that 
at their local game store or their game night or whatever. dry so we're just gonna get a little bit more water into it. Uh oh, summer's coming in. Maybe I bumped the camera with my big head, who knows? Sheened up under the elbow. She's back. Can't stay away, can you? I didn't want to open this camera. It's just gonna drive me crazy. <laughs> I mean, at this point, you might as well just hang out in here. I know. Operate the whole camera yourself. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So those talking about perfect balance, perfect balance is boring. We've talked about it a lot on uh, the various dev panels, the mini extravaganza and stuff, but you don't want perfect balance. Nobody wants that, because that just basically means that every character is the same, they just have a different 
they would just have a different skin. So Psylocke would be the exact same statistical number as Spider-Man, who would be the same as the Hulk, who would be the same as everything else. Miniatures games and really tabletop, most tabletop games in general, they're not about perfect balance, they're about imperfect balance. And the way in which you're looking for that is you have you have a bell curve and that's your basically that's your determination of balance and you can have a really wide curve or you can have a narrow curve and most people when they think about the type of balance that they like best in games. It's not perfect balance, it's just a tight bell curve balance. So what that means is, is that there are always gonna be things that are at the top, at the top, and there's gonna be things that are at the bottom. But the difference between those two is as minimal as you can possibly make it. So everything's as tight as possible while still existing. And where that level is and that line is, is gonna vary from person to person, game to game designer to designer, developer to developer. But if you maintain that and kind of the way that we look at it and the way that we do it at AMG is that curve should be tight enough that player skill matters And therefore, a more skilled player can take a quote unquote lower end character or team or what have you, something that's at the middle to the bottom of the curve. And with their skill, if they have a higher skill cap or level, they should be able to see success with it against somebody with a lower skill who is using something at the top end of the curve. So you want that expression of player skill and strategy to matter. But at the end of the day, if you're just looking at straight numbers with no kind of randomness, so we assume our dice are always gonna be spot on perfect, and there aren't any other variables that are baked in that you can't account for, things like terrain placement, board placement, all of that stuff, because that absolutely has an impact. There are a lot of uncontrollable variables that also affect how the curve happens and how it works and stuff. And those are you know, accounted for and assumed that they will have an impact. And that's again why the game will never be perfectly balanced, because every table is different from house to house, table to table. Player skills are different, all of that stuff. But ultimately, you want that expression of player skill to matter, and that means that you want your bell curve to be tight, but you still need it to exist. And you can always introduce new things that kind of mess with the curve, that change the meta as it, as it is. You put in challenges and problems that you solve again later all of that stuff. That's what a healthy, evolving, ever-growing game wants, like a crisis protocol. You don't want the game to be solved for too long before you introduce more wrinkles to it. And part of how you really affect that is by making sure that curve is tight, but existent, and then allowing players the option and opportunity to affect it. All right. uh, there are a ton of assumptions that people are equally skilled. Nobody really likes to, you know, take into account the fact that if somebody puts in way more time and effort, they're probably gonna be better at something because we all have 
different lives that we live, different abilities and demands on our time. And so you still want, you want player skill to matter a lot, but you also don't want it to be the only deciding factor. And that's where dice variance comes in. How many of us have had the perfect plan that's been unraveled because the dice gods abandon us at the, per, at the inopportune time? These are absolutely things that you want to account for and bake into games as far as we're concerned, because all of our games have variants. And it's another part of those balancing factors that we take into account and want to utilize. And it's part of the fun, you know. Maybe not for everyone, but I certainly play games with folks and have gaming groups and have witnessed more often than not the good stories, the stories that get told over and over are typically the ones that ended in unforeseen ways. Spectacular comebacks, sure things that went awry because the rolling just didn't materialize. Like those are those are the things that make good stories, right? The unexpected. Having the perfect play or the perfect plan and seeing that perfect play and plan come to fruition sure is great. But typically we're not that entertained by formulas and expectation. We like things that deviate and break from the norm. We like the excitement of not knowing what will occur. Excitement of the unknown plays into it a lot. And so you want you want a fun a fun and good game to have that. You want those dice and that randomization mechanic. And you can play with the levels of that, just like everything else. You can have a game that's more random, less random. Just like you can have a game that requires more social interaction, less social interaction. More practice, less practice, all that stuff. All right. Summer gave me the 15 minutes. Let's... Let's go ahead and dive in to this telekinetic katana. So we'll just start with some white. And let's layer it in. Good foundation of white is obviously the darker the undercoat that we try to put our brighter colors over, the duller they'll look. So going with like a nice bright titanium white or an off white is step one to getting A brighter, more glowy end result. And if you had an airbrush, you could absolutely do this part with an airbrush and then use the overspray to kind of create some false zenith highlighting, which could work out really well. that really quick okay and then we need to find a magento which unfortunately doesn't really exist in any of the paints we have here much to my sadness my ultimate sadness so we will maybe use this ball crumb that we go from there okay some of this. Maybe. Where'd my pen go? Hmm. 
I mean, we're in the middle of a play test game today and I think my general average on success versus failure results was over 60% failure rates. <gasps> Look at this. It's ink. Tony brings in a whole bottle of acrylic ink. So here we go. This is going to be so bright. It's going to be great. Boop, boop. All right. Let's rock and roll now. So much magenta. So one of the challenges with magenta is you can't actually mix magenta. Not a true magenta anyway. Um, so if you don't have a magenta paint or an ink or anything like that to work with, you're kind of in trouble. I'm gonna hit it with this hair dryer really quick, Summer. Turn off my mic. Come on. Great. Okay. So now we're just gonna hit it with the ink. All right, we're hair drying again. Because we gotta go fast and inks dry slow. So one of the things you could do to speed this process up is you could always start with kind of a base coat if you were going to use inks. Instead of using a white, you could use like a pink and base coat with a pink or a yellow or whatever. Whatever color you want to have be the underneath of your glow. All right, one more time with the hair dryer. Now what we're going to do is grab a little bit of this ink and some white. Some more white. Make a nice little pink. And we'll just kind of like come in on the edges. So what I'm going to do is kind of similar to the effect that's on the Studio Mini is we'll do kind of a Kirby Crackle style thing where we'll go back to that center and we'll knock in some really dark colors. So normally you'd want your brightest part of your glow to be in the center because that's where that stuff would exist. But because we're going to go in that darker kind of energy effect in the middle. We just want to get some more of that glow on the exterior side so it'll look hot from the outside and cool on the inside and kind of like a magma effect in a way.
And this is definitely a process where like, honestly, the longer that you spend with it and the more you kind of fiddle around with it and mix your different colors, the better results you're gonna get. And this is very much a back and forth process. Or at least for me it is. Maybe you can do it in one. But for me, this is the point where I kind of zone in and I would spend the next 30 minutes just going back and forth. Okay, uh, let's find a black, 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 that'll work. Let's take some black. And I'm gonna mix in some ink to it. I want this black to be more on the magenta y side. So, All right. so and then just kind of come through. center of our effect. Just kind of like lightly tap it in and then build it up. Magenta. Got a little bit of white in there. Let's give it a bit more grab. So at this point you just play back and forth and you break up your, your black and you mess around with your different stuff. And just play with it until you're pretty happy. And then we'll pull some 
basically straight white. Let's cover those little edges. Too much. Wipe that off. And then, just real quick, we can go in and we can do. Pull everything together. This is like you can start two brush blending a little bit with your glaze and mixing it back and forth. And this is one of my favorite parts. It's where I get lost for sure is getting those sections where it's like it's just back and forth going back to the back to the palette, back to the paints, kind of blending things on the mini two brush blending, two color blending, all that stuff until you get an effect that you're pretty happy with. Not bad for 15 minutes. One more time with the hair dryer. really lightly picking out some of those edges just to give us that nice sharp glow hotness and then to finish it if I could find like a fluorescent pink or something I'd probably go over it one more time with fluorescent pink and that would really make it super bright uh, especially on cameras and stuff because fluoros really love to play with. They really pick up light and they have this neat effect when they're on a camera and stuff. Um, so if you want something that's gonna look good and your little snaps and your photos and stuff, fluorescent paint, it's not gonna make it's not going to have the same effect when you see fluorescent paints in person versus like on camera. It's very different. Um, it's because your eye doesn't react to the fluorescence the same as the camera does. But it's still a very cool effect and fluorescents are pretty neat because of it. So that's definitely something that I would probably go back and do. And then of course for all you OSL lovers out there, you can go out there and do some OSL and stuff and really pick that up. Just dip a little. So there you go, there's our quick 15 minute kind of energy glow effect with a little bit of that Kirby Crackle center, the dark in the middle. So you can get that far in 15 minutes, you can definitely um, 
spend twice as long on it, making you look even, even better. But I'm pretty happy with that for a tabletop quality mini. Like I said, a little fluorescent pink over the top of that It'll look really amazing. Or you could just do another couple light coats of the magenta ink glaze, and that would like also punch it up in color. So we got pretty far on Psylocke, not all the way, but that is our hour. Thank you so much for joining me. We had a wonderful time. Be sure to tune back in tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific. Dallas Camp is going to be painting up Clone Commander Cody, Waxer, and Boyle for Star Wars Legion. What? What are you laughing about, Summer? Don't laugh. We announced that tomorrow. We're not forgetting. Well, we've already announced. We know those are coming. Oh, the official announcement happened like a year ago. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you on the next one. Till then, I'm Will, and we're going to leave because Summer's just, she's just dying right now. She doesn't even know. You're just throwing me off, Summer. Just watching you behind the glass. We need a curtain. Just put a curtain right there so I don't have to look at you as you, like, just mock everything that I do. Every last thing. Just nonstop. Never ends. Just keep going. I'm not going to stop until you turn off the stream. That's how it works. I already said goodbye. I said goodbye, like, three times now. You're the one who's keeping this running, and you had places to be. You wanted to...